Awesome. So thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Cam. There's uh, the Testing Talks team for this opportunity. Love coming back to Sydney, Melbourne, wherever you might be. Hopefully, next time you plan in India as well. I don't have to travel this much. Okay. But uh, great to have you all over here. And today, I'm going to tell you why you need to stop doing automation. <laughs> We've been doing so much AI and how to build AI models, testing the AI models. Uh, but I'm going to take you back in time. I don't think any of that is worth it based on the way we are approaching it. Okay. So a uh, little about myself. I'm Anand Bagmar. I work out of India. I'm working with Apply Tools. And if this works, there we go. I used to be a software quality evangelist till a couple of weeks ago. And since then, I've changed my title officially to a software quality bartender. Not because I love drinking. But it could be drink of any choice for that matter as well. But I think it's a very important analogy for me why I'm calling myself a bartender. And hopefully as we go on during this session, that part will become a little bit more clear. And I hope you will agree with me as well that it's a good title, not just a fancy one. My LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, or as people now call it, X. Uh, you can connect with me over there. But enough about myself, I want to understand who you all are over here. Okay, So any testers in the room? Awesome, I'm in the right place. Okay, um, Anyone focused on manual testing or non-automated testing? Excellent. Automation testing, or sorry, that's a wrong word. It's not automation testing, it's test automation. What am I doing? The lunch was really good, Cam, sorry, the effect, you can see that. Okay, uh, so yeah, a lot of people raise their hands on test automation as a activity that they perform as well. Any developers? Great. Leads, managers, product owners. No one? Who cares about them? <laughs> well, they are not here, but it's great. We have got a variety of roles over here, and that is very important for the next question that I'm going to ask you. And I need your participation because I've really had a heavy lunch. Uh, I'm not joking on this. Okay. So first of all, why do we do testing? Doesn't matter what role we play. Why do we do testing? Please shout out. End user experience. Make sure that is acceptable. Again, a very generic thing, acceptable. But yes, you're right. Uh, Mitigate risk, OK? And you got what you pay for. Well, are you really paying for everything? But yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, sorry? Check defects. Check defects, OK. Yeah? Product uh, has the high quality that is expected, OK? Prove that the system is doing what it is supposed to. Prove the system is doing what it is supposed to, OK? Anything else? We don't trust the developers. Developers, your best friend over here. OK? These are the right reasons why we do testing. In some cases, more of one than the other. But yeah, in general, we got it right. We are in the right place. Now, why do we automate tests? Repeatability. Repeatability, OK. Do this now instead of finding it out slow, slower in the manual process, the automated test will tell you that. Okay, hopefully, if it has been implemented correctly, right, with the right assertions, validations. Why else? Because unlike human beings, computers never ask for promotion. Computers never ask for promotion. They just need more resources. <laughs> they just need more resources, more memory, more uh, computation powers, right? Uh, yeah, but it can run at any point in time. I think that's what you really mean as well, to make it a little politically correct statement, right? Uh, yeah. Coverage. coverage. How is that different? To, uh, how is automation going to give you the coverage which? So faster, faster way, OK? A test with more data, OK? More configurations. more configurations. Test more configurations. Reduce human errors, great point, OK? Now, I'm sure there are many more reasons, OK? But if we sort of generalize it, 
First of all, it's fast, the speed that we spoke about. Reliability, reducing the human errors, you're repeating the machine is going to do the same activities over and over again. And it is expected to be reliable, it's expected to give the same type of results that we uh, expect it to be doing. We also want it to be deterministic. Is there a difference in being reliable and being deterministic? Yes, no? How do you infer it? Okay, from automation context, test automation context, what do you think it means? Okay, so reliable is less man, uh, less errors, uh, and deterministic is going to be. Uh, so reliable was also uh, network issues or whatever might be uh, causing it. No, that's not going to be the case. And deterministic is always going to give the same type of result every time, right? Uh, very uh, correct. And that is a very important aspect for automation, right? Reliable is going to take, reduce or remove the manual error. Deterministic is going to tell you if the test passes, everything is good. If it's failing, it is, there is some problem somewhere. There is no if, else condition over there in the result. Pass means good, fails means there's some problem over there. All comes down to the fact if the test has been automated correctly. If it has the right coverage, the right set of validations in place, only then it is going to give you those kinds of uh, assurances. Okay? The most important thing as we spoke about as well is reduce the manual testing effort. Now, let me ask you in each of your teams currently or in your past places where you worked, is this really happening? Anyone please raise your hand and say, yes, we have been able to reduce manual testing. Okay, great. How did you do that? They are automated, so you are saying the manual testing team is not going to repeat those again. Yeah. Right? Great. That means you've got the reliability and the determinism that is required in your ecosystem to make that happen. Right? Unfortunately, though, there was more than half the room which did not raise their hand as well, which is, again, a reality. In your current place, you are able to achieve this. In the next place you go, you might not be able to achieve it because automation Let's agree it is complex. AI or not, it is complex. Then it's always yeah. There are always going to be ifs and uh, buts. And that is the reality again. Okay? It's not a statement or a finger pointing at a particular organization or a person. It is the reality of the situation, the context that makes certain things feasible or not. Okay? Now, if you are not able to get to the goal of reducing manual testing, automation is not going to be helpful. Okay? It is actually causing you more pain than getting the value out of it. Okay? Now, what is the value of automation? We spoke about why automation is important, what kinds of advantages it has. What is the core net value that you get out of automation? We're running those automated tests. Increased coverage. Certain things that we spoke about earlier are still applicable, right? Uh, fast feedback, reduced manual errors, and all those things. But if you really want a quality product, you want to reduce a defect leakage into production. It's not just about running your test in one environment or a couple of environments. It is about really understanding your path to production and where automation needs to run and reduce the defect leakage going from the dev machine all the way to production. That is where automation really helps. And I'm not talking about a specific type of automation here. It could be any type of automated test. Okay? Reduced manual testing is important because that means you get opportunity for the human mind, for the intelligence, for the context of your product, the understanding of the domain to do other types of activities for which you don't get time typically because you have to repeat the same thing over and over again. And 
net result is you are able to do your releases faster with confidence. That is where the value truly comes in. The other aspects are more characteristics of automation. If you're able to achieve these goals, and there are these standard DORA metrics and all those as well, right? Cycle time and uh, MTTR, various other metrics. These are ways to really measure the efficiency of your organization if you're doing things the right way. Tools, technologies, practices, activities will help in those regards, okay? So now, coming back to the question that I asked you earlier, are you getting value of automation in your organization? Okay, let me ask a few more questions to understand this better. In your automation, different types of automation that you have, especially in the functional or end-to-end -end space, do you have a concept of a passing percentage in your automation suite? If X percentage passes, then my build is pass. Yeah, okay. Do you have automatic reruns of your failing tests? To some extent, okay. Are you able to achieve in sprint automation? No, finally someone said no. Okay. Otherwise I thought I'm just having the wrong content over here. Okay. Do you have a hard gate setup for your automated tests? What does that mean? Good question, that was going to be my next slide. Okay. If a test fails, you are not going to release your software to the next higher environment. Do you have a hard gate set up in your team? Unfortunately, in my mind, or fortunately in my mind, if you have answered yes to any of these questions, or no hard gate and yes to any of this, right? You have a passing percentage concept, you have automatic reruns, if you are not doing in-sprint automation, if you don't have a hard gate, I'm sorry, you are not getting value of automation in your team. You are mistaken. Automation is not adding the value to your team the way you want it. By having a passing percentage means you don't care about certain types of failures that are happening in your test. That means you don't trust that test or you don't think that is important enough to take a decision and fix that problem. If you're doing a rerun, that means you don't trust your environment, you don't trust your test, you don't trust your product. Somewhere you don't have trust, there are trust issues, sorry to use those words. That's why you're doing a rerun and hoping the test passes so the cat is off your back. It's someone else's responsibility now. So in my mind, reruns, passing percentages are ways to get around the problem, pass the buck to someone else, you move on, hope everything works fine. If you're not doing in-sprint automation, we are into staggered or iterative waterfall model where you're doing automation later in the cycle. If you don't have hard gate, you don't trust your automation even if it is one test, if it is failing, you don't trust it. You're still going to do a release to your higher environment anyway. Now, sorry to burst the bubble and get everyone awake or either just zone off from here. If you're not getting value in automation, how do you really proceed? And the simplest thing that you can do is set up a hard gate. Set up a hard gate that allows the teams to take a decision, if a test has failed, I am not going to proceed to the next environment. Now, the objective of this is of course to keep your CI build green. If we trust CI, then it has to be green. Only then you can really deploy further. That's how you get to CD, continuous delivery. If your build is red, how can you proceed ahead to, uh, to the next stage, right? So your test, your builds cannot be promoted to the higher environment if a single test fails as well. If you're able to get to that stage, that is the gate of automation that is helping you take those decisions. A failing test indicates there is some problem. It could be network, infrastructure, test data, anything. It could be automated tests, it could be product functionality doesn't matter. A failing test tells you something, a failing test needs to be fixed first, the test has to pass, each and every test has to pass, only then you can go ahead, okay? Very strong words. Easier said than done, okay? And that is what the topic today is about. This clicker is a little slow than me. So this is what we are going to, I'm going to try and share some concepts, some ideas, how you can really get to this 
state of making your automation valuable. Okay? So let's get a quick reality check. This is, of course, easier said than done. The automation objective is for early feedback, low defect leakage, and fast release cycle. We are on the same page over here. Unfortunately, this is an aspiration for us. We understand the concepts. We are not able to get it to implementation phase. Okay? And that is because our applications are extremely complex. Complex products, complex systems, with complex architectures. We work with multiple teams, vendors, partners, depending on size of the organization, of course, who are also spread out all over the world. We work hybrid, we work remote, some people come to office, whatever that might mean. This creates complexities in the way of working in collaboration to really get to a good state of working. We also have unstructured deployments, especially in large systems. It is a big problem. In this unstructured way of deployments in large teams, how many of us still have a QA milestone? We'll get a build on this particular date, and then we will do the testing. Is anyone still working in that stage? Unfortunately, I work with a few places, a few customers who have that. It's a reality. Teams are evolving. They want to get better, but it's a challenge because it's complex systems, right? And when you have the concept of QA drops or this is a QA milestone where you will get a build for testing, that means you have created a silent, siloed way of working. That's a problem. So this is something that we want to try and avoid, but it's a reality right now. The environment instability, because it's complex systems, different teams doing deployments at various times, many a times when you are trying to test manually or run the automated test, your environment could be down because maybe a deployment is happening or some component was not deployed correctly. Either of that is possible, right? There could also be a case for uh, infrastructure issues because these are, again, so many systems need to be integrated together. There could be problem over there. Network issues could always be there. How many of us have got good test environments before we get to prod? It's a luxury that very few teams have, unfortunately. Okay? Configuration issues also become a big problem because you have to configure these environments manually in most cases. It's not really properly uh, scripted and automated. You also have issues related to performance. When I was coming from India, I was trying to book a uh, ticket on Qantas. Performance issues, because maybe not as many people book on Qantas from India, right? Load balancing, uh, the caching issues, whatever it might be. But a slow rendering made the API not return data. You see over here, null is showed, right? I refreshed the page, everything worked fine. Again, not to pinpoint on Qantas, but it's a reality of systems that because of performance issues, your test will also not work at times. Uh, test data is a huge problem, right? How many of us have test data management sorted out? Great, I would like to learn from you how you manage that, right? It's a huge thing, it's a huge challenge. Over here, in most cases, it's unfortunately an afterthought. So now, because of these issues, the current test automation practices also suffer. And that is where the problems start coming up. We are trying. We have got so many challenges in the system, we are adding more challenges on top of that. So now in this, the focus is really on, for the automation team, I have got a huge automation backlog. Automation is my silver bullet. It's going to solve world hunger problems. I want to automate each and everything. So we forget all these other challenges and we start writing more code to test a complex ecosystem anyway. It is always going to be unreliable. We'll always need to find ways to work around that passing percentage, reruns of tests, and so on, to try and get to some kind of sanity to get feedback from the system. Okay? CI's second priority. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but I always, a lot of my hair loss has been because of that. Teams start off on the automation journey. They say, I'm going to automate my, regret, uh, my sanity first, then I will run it in CI. I think it's completely the wrong way. The simplest approach is automate two tests, run it in parallel on your machine. If everything works fine, set up your CI infrastructure, make sure it runs in parallel over there. Your framework is sorted out, your tooling is sorted out. Then you focus on just writing tests, implementing tests, and it will continue to run automatically. CI is an afterthought, unfortunately, in most cases uh, today as well. And of course, there's challenges with the coverage because of this. How much can you really automate? The more validations you add, 
the more uh, slow the test feedback cycle is going to be, the more flaky your test is going to be because you're dependent on more and more information from your application. And because of performance issues, locator changes, and so on, your tests are going to become flaky. Or tests are going to fail because of that. So this focus on automation based on coverage on backlog is what is a challenge where teams end up focusing on the value for them is building frameworks and automating tests. Whereas, why do we do automation? To get quick feedback on quality of the product to reduce manual testing effort. Yes, automation is actually eventually going to end up doing those, but if you're not focused on approaching it the right way, on focusing on the value of what the test is validating, what type of coverage it has, it is not going to help you. I always think it's better to have one test which is running reliably, deterministically, end-to-end -end in CI than have 100 tests. Delete off those 99 if they are not going to give you value, if they're not deterministic, if they're going to be flaky. That one test becomes your hard gate. It tells you at least this one test can actually confidently be removed from the manual testing list of what needs to be repeated every time. That's the confidence you need to build for yourself and for your team. Okay? So we fo end up focusing on building frameworks, adding capabilities to the frameworks, instead of saying, how can I get value from automation today? How can I test my product today and see if it is what I have automated is actually giving me the confidence? of quality, okay? Enough about talking about challenges, sorry to burst the bubble. Let's talk about solutions. But with me so far, do we relate to this? Yes. Yeah, unfortunately yes, I would say, right? I would really be, have loved to be proven wrong in this case, but it is the sad reality. So how do we really get value from automation? We want to make sure our tests, whatever tests we run is a hard gate. Developers will never release a build if any unit test has failed. Why do testers say it's okay to have a failing build? No, we can't, we can't have that. The CI build always has to remain green. Any failing test stops the build over there, the problem is fixed and we proceed. So how do we implement the hard gate? Okay, that is a very important uh, aspect to keep in mind. And this is not about any tool technology over here, this is not AI. It's a very simple thing if you really uh, think about it. For every test execution cycle, the simple understanding is a passing test is always supposed to pass. There is no if and but. A passing test is always supposed to pass and at the same point, a known failing test is always supposed to fail. A failing test is always going to fail because the test is outdated, it is not in sync with our application functionality, it happens or there's actually a defect that has been caught uh, in your application, okay? So now, you've got two categories of tests. One is a passing test, one is a failing test. And if you have that clarity first, then if either of this uh, criteria is not met, the build is failed, okay? Let's dive in even deeper. So the hard gate criteria is, there are two builds now, we are going to separate our tests into two separate builds. The build is going to be passed if the passing tests have passed or the failing tests have uh, failed completely, right? So if any of the passing tests fails, the build fails. If any of the failing tests passes, the build fails. Okay? Passing test should always pass, failing test should always fail. Failing test will pass only if the test is fixed or the product is fixed. The bug in the product is fixed. If you have this criteria met, then the build passes. Because you are in control, I know all my passing tests are giving the reliable results. All my failing tests are already failing, so you have a process set up to say, how do I manage my failing tests? I have to test that manually, or whatever that uh, frequency is going to be, right? How to validate that functionality. Actually, a very simple thing to set up in your framework. Just have some build logic around it to classify these tests separately. The only difference is all the failing tests, each of the failing tests have to fail. If that happens, then the build is marked as passed. Now your CI is green, you are in control of what the quality is. You know exactly what the quality is. Any deviation from this, you don't have to worry. The build will tell you what it is. The biggest problem I have with a passing percentage type of concept, 
Out of 100 tests, 80 tests have passed, 20 have failed. You never know if it is the same 20 tests which is failing every build, every run that is happening. So that passing percentage is an extremely risky thing. We spoke about risk mitigation. It's a very risky proposition for teams to have as a passing percentage. Stop that. Okay. There's this open source framework that I have called TestWiz. I have implemented uh, this functionality over there. It's open source. Please feel free to take a look how the implementation is done. You could apply a similar thought process in your frameworks. Even better, find better ideas how to make it uh, make a hard gate over there. And then share it across with everyone so they'll also be able to benefit. Okay. Now, from an automation criteria perspective, right? what is required to really make this happen? You need to make sure all your application functionality is going to be test, uh, testable and can be tested. All the browser's devices can be uh, tested, what is required from your application. It can scale across all different browser's devices, uh, test as many times as you need as well. It has to be maintainable. Any automation tool solution that you have, product functionality evolves, you have to be able to maintain it easily. You have to be, uh, it has to be, it is easy to use for any role who can use that tool set. These become very important criteria to have. Uh, you should be able to run your tests in parallel, otherwise you will not get the fast feedback that is required. You need to think about, can I run these tests locally or in CI as well? Can I run a subset of tests or the full suite automatically? That becomes very important aspects for anyone to be able to use, and if there's a problem, how to re replicate that problem and see if it has been fixed quickly as well. Developers will be able to contribute even more in that case. Right? It should work with different environments, all the different environments that you have. Of course, it has to be fast, and it should give you insights to be able, so you can take decisions on that. Reporting is, again, something that is not thought of as much. We create a simple HTML report, how many tests passed, failed kind of thing, and it might have a lot of details of each and every execution, but how can you really take decisions on those? I think it's very difficult from that type of static report. So you have to think about the insights part of it as well. And this is where, from a solutioning perspective, you have to think about build versus buy. In fact, it's not build versus buy anymore. It is build versus buy versus reuse. I am an open source contributor. I contribute to Selenium, APM. I've got my other open source projects as well, which help in uh, test automation in various ways, because I'm very lazy. I don't like to repeat the same thing again and again. I'll try to build a solution that I can reuse uh, easily. But at the same time, I don't want, I know I can build some capability. Doesn't mean I should build that capability in each and every case. I want to reuse. In certain cases, there are tools which provide the value out of the box, mature and stable products that are there, which offer a lot of capability. It might be better to use that instead of trying to build something on my own. Because my focus is not on building automation framework. My focus is to test my application under test. See if it is of that expected quality or not. So the focus has to be there on testing the quality of the product, not on building the solution. In many cases, that is required because existing solutions might not satisfy the requirements that we have. So be very conscious about build versus buy versus reuse. In many cases, I see uh, open source we want to use because it is free. Open source is not free. There is a huge cost of people and effort required to building a solution. Yet given a choice, that would be my go-to approach but I have to put the context of the application, the team that I'm working with, to see what is going to work well, and accordingly choose that, okay? So all this said and done, let's get back to the core thing, what we have been discussing in almost all the sessions today, which is very relevant, very important. How can AI help in all of this, okay? For this, we need to first under, quickly look at the test automation life cycle. We first have our design phase. Knowing our backlog, knowing what is important to be tested is extremely important before you start off on your automation journey. When you get to automation, you have to implement it correctly. You have to update and evolve those tests as well because functionality is going to evolve. And not just that, when you start automating, you will start small and you'll keep iterating and adding more capabilities in terms of validations or scenarios. So existing tests should be able to be updated easily as well. Then of course, a test without assertions is uh, as good as not having tests. So have the right types of validations in place to give you the coverage across functionality, UI and UX. And also the NFRs in, uh, in uh, that sense, right? Uh, performance, security, 
whatever is relevant to your application. I have not listed each and everything over here. Once you have that implementation done, how quickly can you execute the test in parallel across all the different browsers and devices? And does it have, especially in context of the UI testing, end-to-end -end testing, does it have self-healing capabilities? Because reality is locators are going to change. That's the reality of software development. With good collaboration, you can reduce it, but it is going to happen in some cases more than others. So if you, need, if you are in that type of ecosystem, then you need to have the self-healing capabilities to try and make a difference, to make your test more stable. Because your users don't care about locators, why should your test care? But that's the way automation happens. So if you can reduce that dependence, it becomes easier. Okay? And then, of course, the most important thing, how to take decisions on these. Okay? Now, let's see where AI can help in this life cycle to help you focus on the right thing. My favorite diagram, the test pyramid. I'm not going to talk about it. Only thing I'll mention is, based on your application under test, think about what are the different types of tests that can be automated. Many a times it is important to say, I just want to test my UI end-to-end -end and stub out all my backend APIs. I'll just focus on testing the UI. If that is what is going to help me test various different combinations, I can make sure my UI testing is happening correctly with UX and functionality as well. And then you start focusing on API workflow and so on, right? So understand what is important to your application. And based on that, you say, okay, what type of tooling and things will help me in testing it more better? Okay? Now, from a design perspective, there are uh, quite a few tools, uh, AI-based tools, which will take your requirements and try to create some visualizations on top of it. I'm a still little old school. I have not used any of these tools so far but I rely heavily on mind maps from a user functionality perspective or business process mapping perspective, how the users will be able to flow from start till finish in my application. And that becomes my input to say what types of tests do I need to automate and at which layer of the pyramid. From an implementation perspective, I have used tools like GitHub Copilot extensively. I use that extensively. Chat GPT and similar, very helpful. I don't have to worry about thinking about code and syntax or implementation anymore. In fact, for that matter, uh, it's been at least 10 to 15 years probably, I stopped thinking about programming language syntax. I don't need to care about it. If I'm interviewing someone, I never think about syntax. The IDEs are so good, why do I need to worry about syntax? The concept is what matters. So if that is how you evolve, then using tools like Copilot and ChatGPT and all, you can get even better. I know what is it that I want to implement from an automation functionality perspective. I'll give it the right prompts, so you need to learn about asking the right question in the right fashion, and I can get a lot of answers from these tools. And with that, you can also, there are other tools like TestGen AI and so on, which will help you generate code quickly in a good structured fashion that will allow you to implement your tests quickly, okay? Not that you cannot write code on your own, it's great if you can do that. It's all about cost optimization. What is the value you are trying to generate out of it? Okay? So these are some of the tool sets that you can use from an implementation perspective. In fact, here's another controversial thought. I'm starting to think that code quality is overrated now. You need to think about code quality from a reusability perspective for yourself as well as for your colleagues who will come after you or who, or who need to collaborate on the same code base with you. But now with AI-based tools, I don't have to worry about that. I'll give them a complex blob of code and tell, him, uh, tell it, explain what this code is doing for me. I don't have to worry about code quality as much anymore. I'll say as much. Let me be safer over here. Okay? When it, that is from an implementation perspective. There's also, uh, from a validation point of view, there are various different tools that you can use. Like uh, Specmatic, I, I was speaking with a few uh, friends earlier. Great tool, without writing any code, just point it to your API specs. It can generate contract tests, API tests out of the box for you. Positive, negative, it generates tests for you. You can run it against a service, see the code coverage, see the quality of that service over there. It can run in a build pipeline. The same spec can be used for consumer and provider side testing. There are a lot of benefits of using tools like this. So it's not purely AI based, but it has AI capabilities from a test generation perspective. Very powerful, it's open source, you can use that, try it out for your APIs. 
the other aspect which I find tremendous value is the visual coverage because I'm writing my end-to-end -end test. I use any tool just to do the interaction. And with AI technology, I can validate the full screen, static or dynamic data, and get full coverage out of that. Functionality, UI, UX, everything at one shot. I don't have to write more code for it. I don't have to write more tests. In fact, I can delete tests because this is already giving me increased coverage. Okay? So Specmatic offers great value. From an API testing perspective, definitely look into that. It does provider consumer side testing, uses open API specs for it, and it can run in a pipeline very easily. So from a validation perspective, we spoke about uh, these set of tools. Let's look at from an execution side of things. You've got your tests implemented. You added the right type of validations. You need to run these tests. You need to run this test. To run the test, you need to first understand how is your code going from dev machine to production. Unfortunately, a lot of team members that I have spoken to in different contexts, they don't know how code moves from dev machine to production. And that, in my opinion, is a big problem. Because if you don't understand what are the different moving parts, different environments, configurations, how the deployments are happening, there are so many opportunities lost in terms of finding out how you can test early and fix the problem before it gets to production. So a simple way that I look at it is create this, this kind of visualization. And each team has its own different visualization. What is the dev code base? Where it is coming, whether front end or back end? What types of tests should the devs run on their machine that makes sense to give early feedback? Then when the code gets into a feature branch, what type of test should run in the build pipeline? What type of test should run when you merge that into your master or main branch? When that uh, artifact is generated in the release pipeline, uh, what are the different environments? How are the configurations going to be applied to different environments? And what types of tests need to run over there? So creating this part to production, and remember the pyramid, right? The pyramid is applicable. What type of test in which environment is it to be run? That is what makes it valuable. That is where test data also becomes very relevant. You need to have a test data strategy to say, if I want to run a particular types of test in a different environment, how am I going to manage the data around that? This type of visualization is extremely important to get a good visualization. Have a big printout on your team boards or wherever confluence, wherever it might be, because this gives you a visibility where you need to test and what types of tests need to happen over there. Now, when you have this part to production, you now need to start planning your execution. Your automation tool set needs to, uh, to support all these types of testing activities or test execution activities. And all of that needs to be automated. None of that uh, should be manual configuration. There is nothing in automation that says, this part I need to do manually. I need to manually click on this button. No. It has to be completely automated. Only then you will get value from automation. The last gate deploying to prod can be a manual check, everything is fine, then I'm going to deploy to prod, but it's still a click of a button and nothing else in that particular case. Okay? So think about how you can leverage AI for your cross-browser testing, which adds the self-healing capabilities, allows you to scale, run the tests in parallel, that can become very valuable again. Okay? The last thing is taking decisions on the test results. I speak so much about report portal, it's surprised that they don't give me any brand loyalty or anything. But it's an amazing tool. Anyone use report portal over here? No one? Oh, you, got, you all are missing on something really very valuable. You can literally say it's open source. It's free. You can set it up in your environment on your laptop using Docker in less than five minutes. It supports all test framework integrations as long as you can create a JUnit XML report out of your execution. Any tool set will be able to create that. You can feed those reports into Report Portal. And once the results start coming to Report Portal, you get amazing capabilities that allow you to take decisions. You can, of course, with each test execution, you can attach any artifacts, screenshots, videos, logs, whatever you want. Attach all of that. Doesn't matter what type of test and where you are running the test. You can get all that information in one place. It's a central server that can be used across all your organization for that matter. All the teams in the organization can use that central server. Just set up a beefier environment in that case, right? It's just load management capacity that is there. But the key benefits that you get out of this is auto analysis. When a test fails, you take a decision why the test has failed. It could be a product issue. 
It could be a test issue, test data issue, environment issue, any of those issues. You tag the issue accordingly, and then with auto analysis uh, in report portal, the next time you run the test, and next time could be after 10 runs as well, if the test has failed with the same reason, it will automatically classify the defect with the decision you had taken last time. Of course, you can override it if required. That becomes a huge time saving about taking decisions on the results. You can also get trend analysis very easily. How often has this test passed or failed? That is very important, especially in functional testing. How to take those decisions. That gives you out of the box. This you know, test that I ran, it passed uh, last five times before that it had failed and so on, right? And with that, you can also create a lot of relevant dashboards and widgets to allow you to take those decisions in a very meaningful form. This report portal uses AI ML capabilities to analyze your test results and allow you to take decisions accordingly. So with all of this, this is great for the scripted way of working, right? You have got your own automation framework, CI pipelines and anything. But if you want to, if you don't have any of this, if you have web applications, I think Applitools Autonomous is a great product as well, which does end-to-end -end all of these things for you in one tool. You don't need any technical skill set to really use it. And you'll be able to do your web application testing, web crawling out of this using AI NLP capabilities, very quickly create these tests and scale the execution. Okay? So if you are interested, you can always stop by the Applitools booth to understand more about that. So with this, I hope you understand why I said I've become a bartender. There are so many options over there. We have complex environments, challenges, which are real. Nothing is fake over here. We know these are real challenges. But you have to choose the right tools, technologies, processes in the right combination to build a solution that is going to be effective. And for that, you need to have an open mind to explore tools, technologies. You should be confident about mix match, build by, reuse. Find your optimal solution in your context, not my optimal solution in your context, right? And AI definitely will help today. And at the same time, AI will get much more better to help even more in the coming future. Thank you so much for your time. I hope this was insightful. I've already asked a lot of questions, Cam. Can I keep this? <laughs> okay. So question of the day. Who is going to try and set up hard gate in the environment? You just raise hands. You have to speak out, right? That's the rule. Yeah, you have to speak up. Cam cannot speak. He's got a bad throat. Okay, I can pick. Okay. Uh, no, let me ask a different question. Who has a path to production already set up in the environment? There we go. Come on. If he explains, then he has to give this to you, OK? <laughs> OK, you are going to sit here and explain this while I hand it over to you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I don't know if you have time for questions, by the way.